Uh, again, I'm Mark Gamble. Um, I introduced myself briefly earlier, but my role here at Actuate is the Director of Technical Marketing, and I actually manage a team of engineers that build out BERT-based applications. Um, so a lot of the demos that you see are products of members of my team. The ones we showed this morning was a collaborative effort as well, and we're uh, most of the time inspired by a lot of the projects that many of you in this room are building at your own organizations. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, effective data visualization, uh, especially when it comes to big data. And I borrowed kind of a classic rock uh, uh, tune here. Every picture tells a story, don't it, for you Rod Stewart fans? But it, it really is a, uh, a, you know, nothing could be uh, uh, more truthful than this. And data visualization really brings this concept uh, home to roost. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, first, kind of, you know, what is data visualization? It's a very self-explanatory term, but if you ask 10 different people, you'll get kind of 10 different uh, representations of what it is. So we'll talk a little bit about what is good uh, and uh, look to some of the uh, industry experts that are out there. Edward Tufte and Stephen Few are some of the more renowned visualization experts out there. And we'll take a look at some of the things that they have to say around data visualization. Then we'll get into visualizing data, some basic stuff. Some, some of you in this room probably already know lots of the things I'll point out, uh, but many people don't. Uh, we sometimes just think a chart's a chart. You visualize the data, that's all you have to do. But there's a lot of different nuances in uh, order to give people the best understanding of what it is you're trying to depict. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll show you some examples of visualizations built with BERT and leveraging some third-party technologies. And then I'll get into a live demo where we'll also talk about BERT styling techniques. I always think that when people talk about good visualization, we only talk about charts and maps, but a lot of people leave out or underappreciate the importance of styling and how important that brings, uh, how important that is to bringing uh, better understanding to the information. So I'll show you how BERT handles styling as very efficient ways in which you can sort of dictate the aesthetics of your application. So first let's talk about what is good data visualization. So uh, data visualization, um, I like to say, is the art of information. And I actually borrowed that from a new article in uh, Popular Science Last month's uh, Popular Science Magazine had a great article on kind of this new age of data visualization and uh, recommend that anybody in here pick that up. It's got some incredible concepts and, and visualizations in there. Um, more succinctly summarized, vis data visualization is the depiction of summarized metrics called from various sources and combined into a single descriptive graphic. Uh, these kinds of visualizations are typically employed for quantitative summarization. Uh, good examples of this are infographics and management style dashboards. These are great examples of uh, kind of data visualization um, uh, vehicles, if you will. So we put big data into the title here. Uh, definitely big data itself presents some unique challenges when you want to visualize it, but we really feel that um, good visualization is good visualization no, regardless of the size or volume of your data. So the fundamentals of good information design apply across the board. Uh, Julie Steele is the editor of Strata at O'Reilly Media, and she has uh, actually written some great blogs and articles out there. She uh, really adheres to this concept that the best data visualizations are the ones that expose something new about the underlying patterns and relationships contained within the data. And she says here, I grabbed a quote, as big data becomes bigger and more companies deal with complex data sets with dozens of variables, sometimes way more than that, Data visualization becomes ever more important. Uh, well said, Julie, couldn't have put it better myself. So what is good data visualization? Well, this obviously is a loaded question because it kind of means different things to different people. So when you start to consider the data visualization and the quality of same in your own applications, you want to consider your audience. Are you creating visualizations for yourself or for a team? or maybe for customers. These are all different constituencies that you have to take into account when you're uh, creating representations of data. So how are they going to use this information? Are they gonna be, you know, are they gonna use it in a proactive fashion? Is it more of an alert type of fashion? 
Um, how statistically savvy are the users that are going to consume this information? Are you, you know, dealing with folks that are statisticians, or are you dealing with folks that know how to, you know, click on a website, but not much beyond that? And then uh, also, how is the information itself consumed? Do people, uh, your users, expect to be able to interact with stuff? Do they just want to be instantly at a glance informed? Do they want to see it on a big screen, or do they want to see it on a tiny screen? These are all things that have direct implications on how you design your uh, data visualizations. <clears throat> so let's take a look at uh, some of the expert opinions. Ed Tufty, uh, first off, um, I don't know how, if I have to give too much background. If, by show of hands, it, or, it, who has not heard of Ed, Edward Tufty? Okay, most of you, only a few of you have not. I think uh, definitely uh, I'll uh, hope to encourage you to, to get some of his books. He's an amazing, amazing visualization expert. Um, in fact, uh, he gives a tour of talks and is coming to town, I think, in a couple of months. Uh, so we'll take a look at Edward Tufty and what he thinks uh, is, uh, are sort of the best tenets of good visualization. And we'll round it out with Stephen Few. Fewer people have heard of Stephen Few, but he's becoming rapidly another guru of uh, visualization. How many folks have not heard of Stephen Few? Okay, so that's good. Actually, it used to be everybody's arm would come up, but now visualization is becoming more and more uh, understood as a key component of your application. So that's great that people uh, know these names. So Edward Tufty has five grand principles of data visualization. So let's kind of go through them and uh, we'll see some examples as we go through. So these are going to be a bit more textual uh, slides, but uh, we'll get into actual visual examples. I have to pose for my picture. Oh, sorry. Should I look like? That's it, I'm teaching. That's my teaching face. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Edward Tufty says first and foremost that you want to enforce visual comparison. You can, uh, users can draw conclusions easier by being able to visually compare data. And it's faster and easier than mathematical or conceptual comparison. Uh, you also want to use techniques like you know, thickness of the uh, lines or thickness of bars and color and weight to be able to convey areas that are most important in your depiction of information. Uh, number two, you want to show causality. You know, causality is the notion that one thing makes another thing occur, right? So causality in a graph enhances and reinforces the meaning of the content. And often, when you create visual, visuals without causality, it can leave the user wondering, what's the point of this visualization? So consider that. You also want to show multivariate data. Well, what does that mean? Well. You want to try and show data on more than two dimensions and enhance the meaning and the point of whatever charts or graphs that you're building. So data with multiple variables enhances the viewing experience and draws the user in. And it also gives them a richer understanding of what they're looking at. So don't, this is a great quote in fact that, uh, that I love that Tufty says, don't bring your work to the level of the user, bring your user to the level of the work. That means you don't want to make or force your user to have to try and figure out what the heck you mean in your visualization. They should be able to figure it out just by looking at it. And so maintain that. Uh, sometimes a novelty graphic looks great, but if somebody looks at it and scratches their head, doesn't know what it means, you've already lost them. So number four, we want to integrate all visual elements. So you want to uh, include images, text, numbers where visually appropriate instead of pushing all contextual information to the legend. And this means you know, creative use of iconography and labels on your visualization sparingly, however. You don't want to overdo it. Another great uh, quote that Edward says is, don't make the user learn your system. Very much related to the last uh, quote that I mentioned. And then number five is uh, content-driven design. That's a nice fit, in fact, for uh, today's event. Uh, good information design never saves poor content. So you want to really concentrate on three main things. Quality. So the if the data is wrong to begin with, the designer is already dead in the water. So you have to make sure you've got quality of data that you're going to represent. Relevance. Why are you presenting this information? 
and for whom. If you're passionate about the topic, it will show in your work. And then integrity. You don't want to use graphs to sort of push an agenda and uh, misrepresent or manipulate, misrepresent information or manipulate the viewer. Of course, none of us in our, this room would ever uh, suggest to do such a thing, but there are uh, examples of this all over the place. If you, a lot of times, especially when we're in uh, po the political season or election years, you're going to see lots of uh, uh, charts and graphs that are actually built by people who are trying to sway your opinion rather than present facts. So we say, an, you know, integrity says that you only present the facts and don't try and skew the results by using uh, visual tricks. So for anybody interested, all of these five principles are available at the uh, link on the bottom, and this presentation will also be made available to everybody. Recommend you read up on Edward Tufte and get his books. They're fantastic. Okay, now we move to, there we are, uh, Stephen Few. <clears throat> so there's some parallels, there's some overlap, but there's kind of a, difference, uh, a different perspective that Stephen brings to the table. Stephen Few is another visualization expert, but his, his background is more firmly rooted in traditional BI and dashboarding. And so everything that he thinks about comes from a BI background. So he, it's, it, he sort of brings that additional dimension to uh, his tenets of good visualization. So let's take a look at what Stephen Few says in his seven core principles. So principle number one, display neither more nor less than what is relevant to your message. Um, what he means here is do away with meaningless 3D effects and uh, meaningless uh, gradient effects that might uh, be there in an attempt to make graphics look slicker, but are actually robbing the user of a more clear understanding. Okay, so you don't want to use uh, background images that distract from simple messages. It's just, you don't have to do it. Number two, don't include visual differences in a graph that do not correspond to actual differences in the data. So what does that mean? Well, visual differences should never be used arbitrarily in a, uh, in a chart. So because when people notice a visual difference, they start trying to compare instantly. So for example, you don't want to show widget say in a bar chart, widget sales as one bar and ball game statistics as another bar. Because when people see a bar stacked next to it, they're going to start to compare. And there's really no comparison. Those are two completely unrelated metrics. So you want to make sure that uh, the kind of the context is maintained in your visualization. Let's go to number three. Um, you want to use lengths or 2D locations of objects to encode quantitative values in graphs. Uh, this means that properties on a, of an object, such as its length, the length of a bar on a bar graph, or maybe its 2D location, um, have a direct uh, effect on how people will perceive the information. So you can leverage these things to your advantage to make the uh, information more readily received and understood. Number four, differences in visual properties that represent values, that is, differences in their length or 2D locations, should accurately correspond to the actual differences in the values they represent. That's a mouthful. What that means is, simply stated, have you ever seen a bar chart where the bars look wildly variant? Some are way up here, some are way down here. But if you look at the Y scale, it starts you know, in the hundreds and starts going up from there. Well, that's a, that gives a false artifact that there are bigger variances between the bars than there really might be. Always start your y-axis in any chart at zero because then you see an accurate comparison. If you start to shrink that y-axis into uh, higher levels of number, you're going to inflate differences that aren't uh, artificial. Looks like my numbering is a little out. There we go. Okay, so number five. Um, don't visually connect values that are discrete, thereby suggesting a relationship that doesn't actually exist. So, uh, you know, basically this is saying that if you create a line chart, you generally, on the x-axis, the bottom axis, want to make that time. Because if you draw a line, you're starting to draw a pattern or a trend. But if you do things like draw a line between department A, department D, B, and department C, you're implying a trend where these are not these are discrete values. There is no trend between them that you can depict in this kind of line. 
So make sure that you, this is where it starts to become important. You use the right visual for the data that you've got. Otherwise, you start to misrepresent it. Number six, make the information that is most important to your message more visually salient than information that's less important. That probably goes without saying. You want to use uh, highlighting or color, things that uh, uh, will make the uh, most important elements of your visualization really pop out. And uh, seven, you can augment people's short-term memory by combining multiple facts into a single visual pattern. So for this, we mean that uh, we're, we're tying into the research finding that short-term memory is limited to about four chunks of information at a time. Uh, that's, this is why all our phone numbers are made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. We, they don't just give you all nine or big numbers because we, we remember things in tiny chunks. So keep that in mind when you're also trying to depict information. If you overload a single graphic with too much information, people will only take away bits and pieces. So Keep it succinct enough that people take away what you intend for them to take away from these visualizations. Okay, so that's uh, the seven core design principles for displaying quantitative information and a uh, link to the information that's is actually a paper that uh, Stephen Few wrote. And Stephen says, good data visualization takes the burden of effort off the brain and puts it on the eyes. That's a genius statement right there. I mean, that's something that anybody that builds visualizations for a living needs to, to really take to heart. Okay, so now visualizing data. <clears throat> Some basics. And these are not hard, fast rules. I'm not a scientist. Uh, these are my own kind of personal tips and tricks, if you will. Learned from almost, you know, what, over 20 years in the industry now. And there are also exceptions for every one of these. But some of these are pretty good to keep in mind as you're starting to build out your applications. Now, I've been saying this all along, choose the appropriate visual for the information. So if you're doing things like tracking values over time, I just actually used an example where we've got time on a, a y -ax or an x-axis and we want to spot trends. Um, a line chart or area chart is well suited for this because they inherently show um, you know, trends and patterns over time as you connect the dots. So the line charts are especially well suited for what they call kind of a histogram style of representation, where you're representing history and ha helping people draw conclusions. Are we trending up or are we trending down? When you want to compare summarized amounts across categories, discrete values, right? Back to that uh, example. Uh, if you do transactions by merchant, for example, a column or bar chart is absolutely the best possible option. And I think bar charts have gotten a bad rap because they're so simple, everybody thinks I have to put something more cool than a bar chart. And what I say is, you want to be so cool, you want to alienate your users so they don't understand what you mean, why not put the simplest thing up there? So I think we need to you know, clean up this misnomer that only heat maps are cool. I think, you know, the, the, what's cool is representing the data correctly and succinctly. Okay, pie chart. This is, this is always one that, that uh, can, can cause fights in the hallway, depending on who you talk to. A lot of people, some in this room actually, uh, don't like pie charts. That's because a lot of times they're used inappropriately. Um, Pie charts sometimes are used to actually compare summar total summarized values. But when you're doing that, like comparing sales by department, the best way to compare, again, back to Edward and uh, back to Stephen, is side by side in adjacent space. That's a bar chart. So the only time I feel it's useful to utilize a pie chart is if you want to represent a percentage of the value against the whole because you can see the whole thing, and a slice gives you that visual instant perception that this is one piece of that whole. And it's a, usually uh, supplemented with a label that says this is percentage. It's very well suited for understanding that. Not so well suited for side-by-side -side comparison. So use pie charts, but use them right. Oh yeah, and donut charts too. So pies, donuts, you know, if, you're, if you have a sweet tooth, these are fine to use. <laughs> so this one is another that might go without saying, um, you want to display, if you have geo 
spatial data, geographic data, and you want to display performance by this data. Um, a lot of times people go, well, no problem. You know, we only have 50 states, 12 counties, whatever. Just put it in a list. But um, we're saying these days, don't put it in a list. Don't put it in a table. Put it on a map. Geospatial information, you know, best friend is being represented on a map. And this is a way in which you can, again, spot trends instantly. Uh, for example, if you've got a heat map of the U.S. and, and you know, there are different gradients, you can instantly go to the darkest gradient and see what state has the you know, highest per capita income, these kind of things. Whereas if you saw it on a list, per capita income, Hawaii, per capita income, Alaska, but how would you know what's the first by at a glance? You just wouldn't. You have to go through and kind of do this mental math. So instead, represent it visually, ideally on a map, people get it immediately. Uh, and it's also really good these days to try and bring some level of animation to your uh, visualizations. Um, because people become kind of more attached to visuals that they can actually touch and play with. And that might be with the mouse, but if it's on one of these or a tablet, they literally are touching it. So you can uh, use modern graphics. Of course, BERT should be at the top of your list to actually help uh, increase the understanding of the represented information through, anima through animation. So you can represent something very succinctly, and people can get more information by mousing over it. Bubbles pop up with supplemental information. Maybe they click on it. It goes to another level of summarization. So animated visuals allow you to more succinctly represent information in a small space. Okay, so that's a, a, and they help engender kind of loyalty and, and uh, uh, enjoyment of your application by your users. Okay, these are some tips because every time I see them, you know, when I'm working with people, I start to holler and scream, don't do that anymore. Um, and I think they might be useful because a lot of us are building charts. Um, when we see that we're building out Hopefully this can be shown uh, on the screen. Um, when category values are too long to display in the x-axis of a column chart. So imagine here we've got our column chart. It's a nice graphic. And if we had uh, categories for each bar that were really long, you know, like such and such hospital, blah, 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 and they just don't all fit. A lot of times you have to then figure out, well, what am I going to do? Do I have make it bigger and make force people to scroll back and forth? Uh, well, a real quick down and dirty way to actually conquer this is turn that bar chart on its side. And then all of the categories can just go right out to the side. So we can see in the comparison graphic, when it's tilted uh, as a column chart, only two of our categories can actually fit in this graphic. But when I tilt it over to a bar chart, all of the categories suddenly show up. It's very subtle, but very helpful. Uh, another one that actually my colleague and very good friend Pierre uh, uh, had to teach me, because I always thought visually when you put a, especially one of these bar charts, that you always want to line them in order, highest to lowest. But when you start to combine this concept with um, a malleable dashboard where you can actually change on the fly your context, now I want to see this for the northern region. Now I want to see it for the southern region. Every time you set that context, the position of a category in that chart could move or disappear. So suddenly people start going, wait, active trading was at the top before, where is it now? So they've suddenly lost that context by virtue of this context uh, sensitivity. So you only really want to stack bars in order when you're trying to convey things like ranking and only when people can't get confused by you sort of jumbling around the numbers by choosing kind of different criteria. So otherwise, you want to use alphanumeric sorting for that, uh, that x-axis. And so kind of the chart on the right is the way you would do it on a day-to-day -day basis unless you were conveying rank, in which, then, in which case then you would put them in order highest to lowest. And this one's just another kind of uh, general tip. Uh, it's not uh, fast and, and uh, uh, hard and fast. But on a line chart, um, uh, especially that which is uh, uh, lots of voluminous data, you don't want to clutter it up with markers that um, are relative to every data point. So we see here, kind of small, but the chart on the bottom and the chart on the top, these two line charts, they're both the, the exact same chart. But all I did was take the markers off of the top one. 
And I think that makes it a lot easier to spot the trends and to understand the data than when you clutter it up with all these markers that are supposed to represent each and every data point. So especially on a line chart where you're depicting lots and lots of data points, you want to sort of stay away from uh, overdoing that. And in fact, early versions of our uh, IoT demo today had markers all over those line charts. And guess what? We were like, that makes it too hard to understand. And we got rid of them, and it got clean instantly. OK, some visualization examples. So um, we're going to go through some screenshots, but don't worry, I've got some live demo at the end. We're going to show you some, uh, some uh, styling techniques as well. But I thought this was a way to get through these very quickly and underline some of the techniques that we've talked about. So here's um, a geospatial representation of US unemployment level. And it is employing some of those techniques that we just talked about. First, it's geospatial in nature, so we've chosen a map to depict it. Uh, second, we've decided to actually depict the concentration of unemployment um, through gradient colors. A single color, that's concentration is lighter or darker depending on the actual concentration of unemployment. So that actually greatly enhances the understanding because you can just look and say, wow, unemployment is really high in the central California Valley, really high up there in Michigan, in the mitten. Uh, but you don't have to try and look around. Imagine instead if you tried to depict you know, every bracket of, in, of uh, unemployment as its own separate color. Then this map would become a dizzying, blinding array of every possible color under the sun and nobody would be able to make sense of it. But in this case, we've been able to actually summarize this information so succinctly, we don't even have numbers. We don't even have state labels. You just look at it and you instantly understand the information. I thought this was a great example. So uh, we'll stick kind of with the geospatial theme and, and go over a couple of additional uh, kind of beneficial points. Uh, and that's the ability to overlay kind of dimensional charts uh, over another visualization. And maps are very conducive to this. So in this case, we're uh, on the top map here of the US. We're actually depicting. Um, uh, airline traffic out of regional airports based on the size of a circle. So, you know, using this, you can actually visually see where's the most traffic, where's the least, very quickly. And then our other example here actually has little pie charts that are, uh, in this case, designed to depict uh, performance of various departments of uh, uh, public works uh, district in London. So that, uh, again, is a nice way to combine visuals and, uh, in fact, is also a succinct way to represent huge amounts of data in a really simple and, and uh, easy to understand way. So then we start getting into animation and interaction. So this is that same uh, charts on top US map we saw earlier. And when you start to actually go to mouse over the different areas of this map, depending on which airport hub you happen to be on, lines will automatically pop up. And then when you go to the next circle, those lines go away, new lines come out. So this is a way to actually encapsulate tons of information, but only display it just in time as the user wants to see it. In this case, we're able to see, mouse over any one of these, you can see the airport name, the originating flights, and then by virtue of the line, where the flights are actually, uh, where their, uh, uh, their destination is. And when you move your mouse away, the lines clean up and you're just looking at the circles. So interaction is a great way to engage the user, give them more understanding, but also keep things very succinct because these elements only come up when the user wants them, when they mouse over these, uh, these charts. So iconography. Um, iconography can also be very effective at helping to um, give users instant understanding of what's being displayed. Although we do want to caution, you want to use it sparingly. Some people kind of go a little overboard and their charts start looking like downtown Vegas. So you, you, know, you need to definitely use some, uh, uh, some consideration there. But in this case, uh, our chart on the left is actually depicting a wealth management and retirement consumer's progress towards their retirement goal. But in this case, they also wanted, the, the firm wanted to also allow this user to depict life event expenditures 
on that progress and see the impact. How's that going to impact when I buy that Porsche and I buy that, uh, that cottage? What's that going to do to my achievement of that goal uh, in the time frame? So by be using these icons, we didn't have to put a label up there that said, my wife's new Lexus or my new vacation house. Just put a little picture there and that's, everybody goes, that's my, you know, I know exactly what that means. That's my car, that's my house, and I see the impact immediately. Further examples of this uh, are the, uh, you know, kind of the ability to use color and little alert icons to convey performance. In this case, we're seeing the performance of various uh, metrics in healthcare at a, at a hospital. And it's easy to see instantly that big red down arrow that something is amiss in these various departments and needs to be looked into immediately. So again, used sparingly, iconography can really enhance your visualizations. Used sparingly. <laughs> Okay, information rich. This is actually a, a dashboard that a, a colleague of ours built modeled on um, an I, sort of an ideal dashboard that it, I think it was Edward Tufte came up with. And notice there's a couple of things here. I mean, we're not looking at 3D effects. We're not looking at meaningless gradients. We're not looking at tons of color and, and uh, icons and things like that. Um, Tufte especially thinks that lack of color is uh, the way to go because you only add color where it's intended to draw attention but the rest of it is pure information. So not only that but there's a tremendous amount of information that's being represented here. So this is a representative of a sales dashboard but when people look at this I like to ask where's what's the first place your eyes go to? The red dots. Hopefully that's what you were thinking. Uh, and that's by design. It's because this is in, in, intended to be a monitor. You can see exactly where all your customers are, your counts, but the red is supposed to draw your attention because that needs immediate addressing. And so the red in this case is indicative of underperformance or underperforming uh, against targets. And we can go straight there and start to uh, take care of it. And uh, also imagine if we had tried to use space grabbing gauges and, and uh, meters to depict this information. This would have been a four page scrolling dashboard. But instead by using succinct, minimalist representations of the data, we're representing, I mean if we count, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different metrics across every customer for this salesperson, all in this little teeny space. I think that's a great example of effective use of space and effective data visualization. Here's one that uh, uh, you may have seen, hopefully not, so that it, uh, I can entertain you by explaining it. Um, this is, a, a, in fact, a great representation of really big data. And uh, this was based on a concept by Edward Tufte uh, of um, small multiples. So small multiples and repetition allow the user to form patterns, visual patterns, by looking at the same uh, visualization side by side by side by side by side. So what we're looking at is, if we look at each individual bar, they're red and green and variants thereof. Each one is, in, uh, is representing a year. They're all made up of smaller squares. And each small square is a day. And further, You'll see sort of divider lines as we go down the, uh, the individual columns. These denote months. So it becomes then fairly obvious this is a calendar depiction. But what else is it actually depicting? Well, this is uh, commercial flight traffic across the U.S. from 95 to 2008. Every flight accounted for every day of every month across all those years. So the, the redder squares indicate lower traffic. The greener squares indicate much higher traffic. So a couple things. When we start to see, understand what this represents, then you can start to see a pattern. At the top band and bottom band of each one of these bars, it's kind of, you know, it seems to be a trend of red. That's because let fewer people fly on the weekends. So the weekdays tend to have most of the green. We also see that the summer months, higher concentration of green in the summer months, in the middle of each one of these bars. And as you take a look, I'll just sort of help you here. Take a look at 2001, and we see 
relatively static traffic, and then right here, it goes red. And it's going red for months thereafter. You guys know what that was? That was 9-11, exactly. So once you understand that and sort of grok the, the intent of this visualization, it actually becomes, I think, again, art. It's the art of information, according to Edward Tufte. And uh, by the way, if I didn't mention this, every one of these examples is built with BERT. And in this case, utilizing a Google API uh, visualization library in order to depict this information. And these many of these examples are available on developer.actuate.com. So uh, again, you know, thanks to Edward Tufte for this concept. And uh, we've actually uh, started adopting this for a lot of different uh, practical uses. But I thought the most dramatic was this US commercial flight depiction. So another thing to, that when you think about big data, people start to get overwhelmed. There's just too much data. How are we going to put that into a visualization? Well, really, when you think about it, when you're summarizing information, especially for an individual, a customer, or maybe a department, or a company, what you're doing is you're whittling that big data down to more summarized, higher levels of information. Okay, But often, that still doesn't take into account the underlying detail that led to this summarization. So you can either depict just the summarization or you can use these techniques of drill down, um, which allow you to display kind of, if you will, small data by the time it's summarized at a very granular level. But as you want to go to the successive layers of detail, you simply click on these graphics. So we see here kind of one looks like uh, uh, you know, the, the Final Four basketball, but it's actually designed on that. You can click on any given country and it opens up the cities that are relative to our data. And you click on any city, it opens up the businesses and so on and so forth. So you, while there's a tremendous amount of data summarized here, you only look at the information that you want to. It's a very efficient way to summarize and represent um, highly voluminous data. Another example is the tree map right next to uh, kind of our, uh, our hierarchy. And this uh, actually takes multiple dimensions into account. So it utilizes shape and color. So it's depicting two dimensions. Uh, in this case, the uh, shape is the medal count for the, uh, the last Olympics. And, and uh, the color is the difference of performance from the previous Olympics. So in this case, we can see, you know, for example, Central America looks to have um, uh, done very well from their previous Olympics, but because of the size of the box, they're just not, you know, they're not the most winningest country uh, uh, in the Olympics. And when you click on any one of these countries, you go then to the next level of detail, and you'll see a breakdown of all of the uh, counties or cities that uh, uh, roll up into these countries. So uh, breaking up these large summarizations into drillable representations of data is a great way to still present you know, dizzying amounts of data, but in a spoon-fed way that people can consume and understand very easily. Yeah, yeah, so the question is, are these gadgets? What these are, essentially, yeah, they, uh, what they are are visualizations built in BERT, in some cases with our native uh, charts, but in, the ca in these two cases, these are actually utilizing uh, Google API, Google Visualization API. So BERT serves as the, the uh, conduit. It gathers the data, summarizes it, and then within a uh, report design, passes it off to these embedded graphics. And then in turn, these graphics can go on the iHub, which is the heart of the BERT ecosystem, and then absolutely become uh, gadgets. And gadgets in, in BERT vernacular are the little visualizations that you arrange into a dashboard. That's what we call gadgets. So it, it, that was a long way of saying yes. <laughs> okay, so style techniques. This is where I kind of take a different, uh, a, a different turn. Um, I had the option of just continuing to show different types of charts and things like that, but um, we like to emphasize also the, the level of sophistication that uh, BERT can bring to styling. A lot of times people think if you just choose the right chart, you're there. But style, and by that I mean 
what colors you use, what fonts you use, also play a major, major role in how people receive your application. So it's not just the charts, but it's the overall look and feel of, uh, that, that lend itself to your uh, big data representation. So how does BERT handle styling? Well, of course we have charts and graphs and you can change colors and things like that, but BERT has this concept or notion of being able to encapsulate collections of, uh, of those kind of aesthetic styles that you can then apply broadly across an entire application. So at the lowest level, we have styles. Yeah, it looks like my builds are a little out of, out of whack. Okay, so there are three layers of style control in BERT. At the lowest level and most granular, there is the style itself. What is a style? Um, a style is granular aesthetic settings. So when you say, I want to set up a style for a header in my report, what you're going to say is, every time I apply that style, I'm going to have a given font family, font size, font color, border, background color, and it's like this little collection of attributes that you can apply to small elements of your report at once. So styles are key. Okay, what do styles actually build up to? What's the next layer? The next layer is themes. So in BERT, you can create themes. And themes are collections of styles. So if you start to see the layers, styles are a collection of settings. And when you create a collection of these styles, you can then say this is a theme. So we might have, in fact we do, we have an actuate theme. And it dictates the style, the behavior, the colors across an entire application. And many of our customers employ this to not only dictate the look and feel of their application, but also govern how quickly they can change it. Because themes lend themselves towards rapid, rapid changes. So styles roll up to themes. Themes can then roll up to libraries. Okay, so libraries is not a thematic element in BERT unto itself, but it is a great booster. Libraries are an encapsulation of BERT components that are centrally managed and can dictate certain things in your BERT applications. So you can have, for example, a library that has a business, val or a business uh, calculation in it, or a library that has a logo. And these things, are, you know, to whatever level of sophistication or simplicity you want. And developers just drag these elements out of the library into their own applications. And the library is centrally maintained, and it dictates uh, what the look and feel of every application that uses it. So the, the uh, benefit here is that if you decide you've got a full color scheme, you roll out your application, and you, you guys acquire another company or get some marketing firm and change your whole color scheme. Well, are you going to go out and collect every report, every dashboard from every user's account and change them manually? Absolutely not. So library says you just apply that change or those changes in one place and they cascade across the rest of the application automatically. I'm going to show you what that looks like. So um, another way in which you can um, make most efficient styles is to leverage these um, resources that many web application developers use to sort of uh, govern the look and feel of an entire website. They're called cascading style sheets. And what these are, it's just very simple code and it, it has definitions of every type of uh, you know, font or cell or, and, and style therein. So a lot of websites use it to control the look and feel of their entire website. Well, guess what? You can use those same files in BERT content. And this is another reason why we're able to meet the demands of embedded analytics. We can be so seamlessly embedded because you can use these techniques to make the visualizations take on the persona of your own application. So uh, various options. I'll actually show you a live demo of this. In fact, uh, I think I, it might be time. Oh, we'll go over, we'll just cover themes and then I'll d dive in. How are we doing on time? 10 minutes, perfect. Ah, my evil plan paid off, I will be done on time. So themes, again, a theme is a set of styles and uh, these are defined at the report level or the object level. They can really apply to any element within the BERT ecosystem. 
and um, you're able to, to, we provide you themes out of the box. You don't have to start from nothing. Uh, in fact, what most people do is they take our out of the box themes and then personalize them, extend them for themselves rather than create something from scratch. You have the luxury of doing either. And I'll show you how that works. So uh, in fact, we'll take a look at this as a live example. Okay, lastly, libraries. Um, these are, as I sp stated earlier, collections of reusable components. So it's not just style elements. A library has anything that can be in a BERT report or a BERT content. Um, report items, uh, th you know, thematic elements like master pages, and then ultimately themes and styles themselves. And it's that centralized control that uh, the libraries bring to the table. So it enables really rapid change. You can change an entire application by just changing a theme in a library. Don't believe me? I'm going to show you. Uh, just a couple of simple designer demos. We'll show you how BERT utilizes CSS and how the library concept um, lends itself towards rapid changes um, as well as uh, kind of um, global uh, styling across your entire application. All right. So I'm going to go into the BERT design environment. I'm not going to make this a tutorial of BERT designer. Uh, hopefully most of you have been exposed to it if you're uh, at this event. Um, uh, so what we're looking at first is uh, in the design environment, a fairly straightforward, ho-hum, zero styled uh, report. So uh, in this case, let's say that I work for an organization that relies on ca cascading style sheets to, uh, uh, again, to style up our website. And so I want to be able to utilize those same styles, and I don't want to go in and gran in granular fashion set properties on each and every cell for, you know, color and font, and then this one, its color and its font. You can do so if you wish, but this whole, this whole theme concept says it does away with it. Instead, let's just do this all at once utilizing CSS. So I'm going to go into the outline of this design and into our styles. I'm going to say, instead of creating my own styles, I'd like to use a CSS file. Hopefully everybody can see that. So uh, in fact, just, just show you what it is. I've got it open here. It's standard cascading style sheet. Notice we have you know, a definition for the title, for the table header, group header. So what I'm also doing is utilizing um, reserved names in this uh, content. And I'll show you what, what benefit that brings. So let's bring in that CSS. Say I want to use that to style up all my content. So we just simply reference it. And this is actually uh, big too. If there's a checkbox here that says include CSS file at view time. For, the, for you app developers in the room, this says that you can actually make sure style elements from that CSS are applied when the person looks at it. That's centrally managed. That means that you can change it out, swap it on a, on a dime, and the next time that person looks at it, it has all the new changes. So this is, uh, again, a real efficiency. So here's all of those, uh, those different styles that are in my CSS, and because I took the liberty for demo's sake of using those reserved words, they automatically applied into my table header, my group header, my detail. Now, my uh, content has taken on the color scheme, font scheme, and layout scheme of my website. And uh, just, again, by simply uh, applying a very straightforward and, and quick CSS. Okay, let's take a look now at uh, themes in a library. <clears throat> so I'm actually going to go to a library. Again, library being centrally controlled collection of components. And uh, in this library, we have, amongst other things, themes defined. So it's actually very easy to create a theme. Let's go into our default theme of modern. So really, it's just like when you create a chart in BERT, except instead of defining what numbers go into the axes, you're defining what colors go into the bars. So you can specify you know, what the uh, initial look should be, and then ultimately format across the entire collection. So in this case, in our modern theme, we said we want to go with this blue palette, 
bar charts should look like that, area should look like that, pi should look like that, and so on and so forth. So we've tried to make sure that we dictate what that's gonna look like across every possible permutation of this visual. And this further is also drawing from CSS. So let's take a look at what a dashboard looks like that's using that theme. And then I'll show you how quickly we can actually change it. So still in the designer, we bring up a dashboard, and for the sake of time, I've pre-prepared it. And this is using that modern theme. So we can see now all of those settings have been applied that I've, dic that I've uh, put into that theme. But now, somebody from marketing comes running in. Oh, we've just changed our entire color scheme. We're changing our whole website. All these charts for our customers have to change too. Well, luckily, I'm using BERT, so I can do that really simply. So I'm gonna go back into the design environment and we'll go back into that theme. Okay, so the theme here was modern. So I can actually start changing it here, but instead, what I'm gonna do is, is make use of even quicker. Let's say here's our new theme. Somebody has gone off and created it. It's warm red, it's got you know different type of font, dramatically different from our previous look. But I wanna just blanket that across my entire application. So I'm gonna do, is rename the original. You can see where this is going. I'll just call this modern old. And then I'll rename the new one to modern. Okay, and let's go back to our dashboard. And it helps if I save it. That was a lesson for us all. <laughs> Indeed. And so there you have it. I mean, a simple example, but uh, I mean, I had to do a quick cut, copy and paste. And now we've got an entire new look and feel across this dashboard. So extrapolate from that, that every visual in your bird application would start reading from these new definitions. So everything would change. So it's a, again, simple way of looking at it, but that's the power of BERT's styling capabilities when combined with um, libraries, is that you can uh, affect changes across the application at a moment's notice and on a dime. Yes, we have a question. Uh, the question is, can you customize and add to the library? Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, I mentioned it earlier, developer.actuate.com is a, a site that anybody working with BERT should bookmark because not only will you find information of how that can be applied, you'll probably find some work that other developers have done. This is a place where other BERT developers will create their own libraries that do some amazing things. One of the main perpetrators is sitting back there in the corner, Pierre Tessier, yeah. You're gonna see his, a lot of his contributions there. These are libraries that are free for all of you. Download them, plug them into your own BERT designs and you're off and running. They're a jump start for you and a, a good, uh, look at the power of community. Great question. So uh, any other questions? I see we've got a, a whopping whole minute left. <laughs> and it's unusual for me to bring it in on time. So I want the organizers to uh, uh, note that. <laughs> All right, uh, I don't think I had any big closing. I uh, do wanna encourage everybody to, um, if you haven't already, started working with BERT, you know, download the free stuff. Uh, the F-Type, if you haven't caught any of Brian and Kat's sessions uh, next door, do so. Because everything I've been showing you today, I mean, even earlier, we were running our IoT demo and everything else off of the iHub, and F-Type's just a free version of the iHub. So we're not showing you stuff that you have to sign up and get to some high level and shell out a bunch of money. Everything I've done today and Pierre's done today can all be done entirely for free. So take advantage of that. And uh, Bert rocks. It's been my pleasure to uh, present to you today. Oh yeah, uh, go to the app um, and uh, make sure you give uh, your wonderful presenters feedback on how awesome they are. And, uh, <laughs> and we look forward to you enjoying the rest of the show. Thanks very much.